days, Lord, we thank you for the way you move. Just say, God, we want to be very much in union, full experiential union with you, God. Just to be walking and moving and as you move as a lamb. Moves that, God, we would follow you wherever we go, Lord, wherever you go. Lord, I just pray that there would be a refreshing presence of God here for everyone who is here. Lord, would you renew us with the presence of the living God right now? Lord, would you breathe into the dry bones and the areas of dryness and the areas, God, of deadness? God, in the areas, Lord, where it just seems like we have just are dry and dead and desperately need you, would you breathe into the dry bones, Lord, the very breath of God, Lord, into the dry bones for the life of God to be released in greater fullness. We just say, Holy Spirit, we desperately need you. <laughs> Lord Jesus, we desperately need you. Father, we ask you to bring us into that, by the Spirit of God, into that experiential union with Christ. God, whereby we experience you in a much deeper way, Lord. We yield to you, God, and say, have our, heart, have our hearts fully. May this be a corporate work, Lord, that we go forward together and that no one lags behind by distraction or indifference or selfishness or other things, God, that would keep us, Lord, from moving forward together as you move forward in this day and age, God, in which we live as we prepare for the second coming of Christ, Lord. May we, may our hearts be set of a flame, God. May we have oil in our lamps, Lord. I pray that, Lord, you would bring us back to that place of first love, God, that place of communion, that place of getting oil, Lord, that place a burning before you, God, that you would just, Lord, rekindle in our hearts, God, that flame of first love, the oil of the Spirit of God, we pray. Lord, we just even give you control of today, Lord, that you would have your way this morning and what you want to say and what you want to do in the direction of the Lord and the way you want to go, Lord. We just yield ourselves to you and say we love you. We want to be that generation, Lord, that says yes to your coming and yes to the need to be made ready, that we would not be guilty of delaying your coming, God, because of lack of readiness and lack of preparation. May we do our part, Lord, and may we be a voice to others, God, that whatever that number is required for the catalyst, catalyst to start the events, Lord, that is needed for readiness. Lord, may we be a voice to others to see that come forth, we ask in Jesus' name, Lord, that we would be fully prepared and ready by your Spirit dwelling in us, God. Have us, Lord, have today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen. Thank you, worship team. Thank you so much for leading us into the presence of God this morning. And uh, yeah, so uh, we'll go ahead and... Um, We'll get the live stream going and uh, just want to share a few things here with you. Um, worship was so good and the time, yes, all the messages have been good and just, uh, I just want to share um, one announcement and then I want to share a couple things the Lord laid on my heart. So, um, give me the light, give me the thumbs up when we're going live here. Okay, we are live. Okay, sorry, we are live. I didn't realize that. Okay. We're officially live. So just I want to make one quick announcement. Um, we are starting a class. Uh, the Lord put it on my heart to teach on a series called The Day of His Power. And uh, this series t looks at Psalms 110, Psalm 110 and then connects it to Revelation 12, Revelation 7 and 14, and Revelation 11. And I, I felt the Lord moving me and leading me to, to make this into a class where we send out videos and notes and have Zoom calls and stuff like that. So we're going to start that in October. And uh, Revelation, as I've been saying um, for a while, Revelation chapter 12 is the most important, in my opinion, the most important unfulfilled prophecy. And it's the most, in my opinion, least understood and most misinterpreted. And it's vital that we understand it because we have a vital role to play in it. It is the catalytic event that unlo unlo un unlocks 
all the other events of end time prophecy, without this being fulfilled, every other thing could not happen, including the Lord's return in the millennial kingdom. And I find that the church really lacks understanding in this. And, and because of scholarship and all that, this prophecy has been muddled and muddied, and I don't think a lot of people understand that prophecy. So it, we're doing an in-depth class. We're doing this, this teaching is an in-depth, verse-by-verse teaching on Revelation 12, Revelation 7, Revelation 14, Revelation 11. We're going just verse by verse through it. So I want to encourage you if you want to be part of that class. What I found is in th this particular topic especially is discussion is very important because we all have questions. I mean, this is deep stuff. I mean, it's not, I'm not trying to be like purposely deep or mysterious. I want to make it simple as possible, but there's complexity here. And a lot of times when in the church we get complexity, we just say, oh, I don't want to even try to even attempt to understand that. I don't even know what that means. It's too complex. And the hour we live in right now, we can't be that way. We've got to have understanding. I think Josiah mentioned that. Those who on uh, Friday, that those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many. We, it is important that we have understanding and insight. So anyway, just want to encourage you to be part of that class. If you are interested, you can just email us at info at restorationlife.org. If you have some friends also that might be interested in that, just share that. We got to get uh, the, this word out to a larger body to, so that we can have understanding and be, that, be the catalyst that initiates the Lord's return. So amen. Hopefully you'll share that with some people. Um, I just want to give, just real quick, I, I want to share, actually I was talking to Terry before the conference, and, or before today, and I was sharing with, with him how something he said confirmed uh, a season we've been in, and I, I want to just take about 10 minutes to share that, that, that with you, especially for this church, but even if you don't go to this church, I think you'll find this encouraging. Um, just... And I'm going to take a step back all the way back to the end of March. We, in the end of the March, we had uh, Sam Sullivan come and speak. And um, Sam's a really awesome friend. And um, he, him and Ben DeSmukes have started a church in Clarksville. But anyway, so it starts, the, the story starts in the end of March. And he, Sam comes and his family comes. And uh, anyway, I've got pastoral, i got PTSD pastoral stress syndrome, you know, when things are going really well, I've realized, okay, something's about to happen because it was like the most beautiful fall, uh, spring day. We went to the park. We, Sam and I went and we, we took the, the kids to the Kennesaw Mountain and uh, we went and got ice cream after that with our family and then we went to the park and we're throwing the Frisbee, playing soccer and I'm like, okay, this is, this can't be this good. I'm like, this is a great day. I'm like, you know, that's like the, 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 the wounds in me that are like making me, like trigger me. And I'm like, there's no way this can be this good of a day. I'm like, what's going to happen? When's the shoe going to drop? Anyway, we go home, we cook steaks. And um, I had to, had to pay Sam back because when we, he cooked steaks for us one time, it was like the burnt offering. <laughs> it was so charred. And uh, so uh, I had to like show him what a real steak was cooked, uh, how it was cooked. And it was awesome. It was awesome. Then we played pickleball. And I'm competitive, and, you know, Sam's pretty good, but we beat him. Me and Anna beat him and uh, his son Truman. And I'm just thinking, okay, there's no, something's got to go wrong here because this is, like, too perfect. And then all of a sudden at about 8.30, we're playing pickleball, and I get this emergency phone call from Angie, and she's going, uh, you need to come home right away because we have w water in our basement is leaking from the toilet. And I'm thinking, oh, God, okay, that's, there's my PTSD for, for a reason. Okay, it's so what's gone wrong now? So anyway, what happened was the sewage ejector pump in our, uh, had gotten stuck. And it was really significant because um, Sam had told me before, he had shared with me what he was going to share about. And one of the messages the Lord had given him was, Many of us at our church were stuck. We were stuck. Our, we, were, we were in this place of stuck. We had a broken hoper, but we were stuck. And I'm like, oh, my God. So anyway, the sewage ejector pump was stuck. And so it, the sewage spilled out into the basement, and we had to call a plumber out at like 9, and he got there about 10. And I wasn't happy. He wasn't happy. And he started going, and I, I've told the story, but some of you haven't heard it. But he started like trying to fix this thing, and... I felt bad for him because the, the automatic trigger kicked in and, and, and it just got all over him. And I mean, 
I heard profanity that I had never heard in my life. I was like, is that even a cuss word? Because I, I was like, I've never heard that. I've been involved in a lot of bad crowds in my pre before when I wasn't really walking with the Lord. And I'm like, I've never even heard those cuss words, but I, I felt sympathy for them because I'm like, it's like one in the morning. No, not, it's about 11 or 12 at night. And it, this sewage is flying all over him and all this. And I'm going, okay, I, I have a lot of compassion for you. I have a lot of compassion. Um, anyway, he gets it fixed. We go to bed. I think we went to bed about two in the morning. And uh, anyway, we were very, very tired. And, but I, I, we felt like, okay, me and Angie felt like, and mom and dad had felt like, okay, this is prophetic. Um, the, uh, the, the sewage ejector pump was already going bad, but we felt like, okay, God is saying something to us in this, that uh, as a church, we've gotten stuck, and now the, the poop, so to speak, is spilling out into the foundation of the basement. And so anyway, yeah, we were, anyway, so anyway, Sam's message, if you remember, that was really, really powerful, it, it, and it, it it did something too. It, it initiated a work of the Holy Spirit to, it really brought the poop out in a lot of our lives, kind of, you know, I mean, you know, so not even kind of, but it did in my life, all of our lives and definitely the plumber's life for sure. <clears throat> um, but anyway, so we felt, we kept feeling like okay, this is prophetic. This is prophetic. And I'm, I'm very skeptical of saying things are prophetic. I always want to make sure, okay, God, is this really you? But sometimes and it's even, it's biblical. Sometimes the Lord, if, if God calls you to live out and experience what the Lord is speaking. And I, I knew like, okay, God is saying something about our foundation. God wants to clean and cleanse the foundation. And so we had a restoration company come out and they, they cleaned the, the basement. And then we had to get all the floors ripped out. And I mean, just, it just went through, I mean, we, we just finished, that happened in, at the end of March. We just finished the work hang the mirror back up on Friday. And so then not only did that happen, but then it's like, we're like, God. And then we had some mice get in and we said, so we started to have like put mouse traps in there. And then I told the story that a snake got in through our garage door in our basement. And we're like, okay, <laughs> when I start dealing with snakes, I hate snakes. So it's like, it freaked me out. I had to go, I lost my man card. I mentioned that. I had to go get my, I had to like go get our next door neighbor over and she loves snakes. I'm like, okay, come on over because we'll have a snake party here. And so she comes over and, you know, it's, it's really, my masculinity was very like, uh, I lost all masculinity when he comes over. She comes over and she gets the snake out and brings it out. And so anyway, I'm like, yeah, I'm not a man anymore. <clears throat> but I'm okay with that because I'm not about to touch it. And I just, anyway, so. We finally said we've got to even replace not only the, the garage door, we've we got to replace, the, replace it with French doors. So we did that. And finally, we hang the mirrors on Friday, right when Josiah and Isaac and Terry are coming. And me and Angie both felt like, okay, the Lord is saying, I think the Lord's saying to us in this, I think the Lord's saying is his work that Sam, uh, the Lord used Sam to initiate has been completed. Not, not to mean we won't ever have issues or whatever. And in, in that season as well, in that season as well, I forgot to mention that, is the Lord gave us about five or six prophetic words, whether they're visions or dreams from people I very much respect. And the theme of it was divine order. It was all, every single one of them were divine order, divine order, divine order. And the Lord had given me a dream. And the dream, in the dream, I, I, won't, I won't share the details. I'll just, I'll just give you the, the quick interpretation of it was, was I, it was requiring me in the dream, the Lord was requiring me in the dream, I've got to be frank. I've got to speak with frankness so we can have divine order in the house of God. <clears throat> so anyway, five or six dreams, and God was kicking off this initiative to bring divine order. And so then uh, Terry, um, you know, I, I, one thing about Terry is I, I, I try not to share too many details because I want when he comes to make sure, okay, I haven't influenced him in what he's going to share. So it's coming from the Lord and it's not, I know Terry wouldn't even do that anyway, but I just like to make sure, okay, I'm not even going to share him kind of the season we're in just so he, what he gets from the Lord is, you know, clearly revelation from the Lord and not influenced by me. Although he would, he's, he's so seasoned, he wouldn't, that would not affect him in any way. 
But so, and to think, listening to him yesterday, it was all, I mean, he must have, must have mentioned divine order, divine order, divine order a um, hundred times. I mean, it was like the, the theme of the message, divine order and building the wall and laying the foundation and all of that. And I was like, okay, that's, that's the Lord confirming very clearly to us the need for divine order. And then when he read Nehemiah chapter six, I want you to turn to that verse of scripture uh, Nehemiah chapter 6, uh, verse 15. He read that yesterday. And when he read that, I was like, oh my goodness. That is a, a rhema for us. That is the word of the Lord to this, this body, Restoration Life. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15. Uh, when the wall was completed, uh, uh, so the wall was completed on the 25th of the month. And today is August 25th. Like, so when I, when I saw that, I was like, God, you're speaking in that, you know? That's pretty amazing. Um, Terry had no idea of that. The Lord just, he didn't even know that until I told him. So it was like, almost like the Lord was saying to us, the restoration life, that work that was initiated through Sam, that season that God was dealing with us in certain areas, bringing divine order, uh, that season has been, that work has been completed. That doesn't mean we don't ever have work, more work related to that. There will be. But the, the emphasis was completed. I, I just thought that was, uh, was such a, a, a cool confirmation. So the wall was completed on the 25th of the month in 52 days. Now, it took way more than 52 days. I wish it was only 52 days. But it was interesting to me when I saw 52 because I, I, I'm 52. I turned 52 in February. I was just like, hmm. It's just, just God little giving little confirmations there to us. It was really beautiful, just how the Lord, how the Lord speaks like that. And um, it's, it's, I'm really thankful for Sam, the Lord using Sam to initiate that whole process. And then Terry and Josiah and Isaac to kind of confirm that. And just to see how God really stressing the need for divine order um, and in the house of God, for him to have what he wants. And so, anyway, I just wanted to share that. I thought that might encourage you to see, okay, because a lot of times, a lot of times you're listening and you may not know the whole backstory and what the Lord is really emphasizing. I, I just wanted to highlight that there so you could see, okay, wow, the, the fingerprint of the Lord on this conference was beautiful, that God was confirming that his work of bringing us into divine order has been completed. And I, and I say completed in quotes because it's never fully completed, but that season has come to an end almost of what God wanted to do. So I, I believe God um, has really used them to help a lot of us get unstuck, as he also used Sam to help us get unstuck and get into this, uh, this end-time move of the Holy Spirit in what he wants to do. So anyway, I just wanted to share that. I thought that would encourage you. Um, so now, uh, I think today is going to, Isaac's going to share first. And so Isaac was really, um, you know, the Lord had given something to share and Isaac just kept insisting, I've got to share this. Like Isaac, you know, it's, it's, I'm kidding with it. I had to like, basically like twist his arm to share. But, uh, yeah, I was like, Isaac, calm down, man. You, if you really want to share, you can. No, no, I had to like twist his arm. Like, okay, I think you need to share. So Isaac is, Isaac's a really good communicator. So Isaac is going to share what God has given him. And then after that, Josiah is going to share. So uh, Isaac, uh, yeah, thank you so much. No, you came out in divine order. So. Good morning. Good to see everyone here. I'm Isaac, as he had said, uh, Terry's son-in-law. Um, for all you that don't know me, I know most of y'all, I've been coming here for a long time with dad and Josiah, blessed by all of you guys. Um, that was beautiful, Brian, and I think just for what the Lord is doing, for what the Lord is doing in this season, but also over this weekend, just bringing all of that together has, has at least, I mean, that's encouraging for our hearts, I know, for y'all. Um, we obviously are with you guys, with you, Brian and Ken, and uh, I think to bring a little bit more language to what Brian was actually just saying, from what I felt from the Lord was, I'm going to read a scripture here out of Isaiah 52, but um, yeah, let me read it first, actually. So it says, wake up, wake up, clothe yourself with strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful clothes, O Jerusalem, holy city, which that's the same city there in Revelation uh, 21, 10. 
Um, <clears throat> it says, uh, for the uncircumcised and unclean pagans will no longer invade you. Shake off the dirt. Get up, captive Jerusalem. Take off the iron chains around your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. It goes on. There's a lot in this. Um, I'm not going to speak this morning, uh, so I won't, I won't continue. But this is it's really good. It's, it's really good. And uh, just that, that snippet there, I think, speaks of a ton of what you just said. Um, of getting out the impurities, right? Getting out the uncleanness in us so that we are pure, right? And we can become that holy city of Jerusalem, right? Uh, like Dad said, it, it's the inward in us, but it's also an actual city, right? Um, and, and to go along with that, I really felt the Lord um, just saying that, Brian and Angie, Ken and Donna have laid a foundation here at this body, and it's beautiful. They've yielded to the Lord in that they've allowed the Lord to do his work here and not resisted him. And that's rare. I know Dad has said that before, but it's rare. It really is to have leaders that love and care about y'all so much that they're willing to go through whatever it takes for this body to come together in the fullness of what the Lord has for it. So I want to say thank you for y'all's stance, and we love you guys. But also there's an opportunity. Sorry. Yeah, we love you guys. You know? But there is an opportunity, and this is, again, going to what Brian said. There's an opportunity of the Lord, and that opportunity is now for the body to be built on that foundation. Right, And that is what I believe this whole conference has been about. The Lord shared that with me before hearing what Dad was going to say or Josiah. And that's not to puff me up. That's just to say the Lord is making it clear. He is in a season and in a mode of building his body corporately. We have our own responsibility individually, but he has, he's after something in us. And the beginning of Isaiah here, 52, wake up. May we wake up and see, truly see what's going on, truly see the times that we're in, what the Lord is after, and how can we align ourselves and yield to the Lord and yield to the leadership, which is the Lord moving through them, and be builded rightly so we're ready, so we're pure, so we're holy, so the profane is cast off of us, right? And that sounds like, Obviously, from that season, that was what the Lord was doing, right? He's getting us to a place of readiness, right? Our response, our responsibility is to be yielded to that work, right? Not to resist it, not to be stuck, you know, but allow it to come out, you know? Allow the crap to come out, whatever it is, right? Just allow the Lord to drive that out of us so we're ready. So just a a few uh, points here. Um, and this, this goes to uh, really just in line of what, what y'all have went through here. But the Lord just spoke. I want them, aw- and this is for the body of Christ, myself, and for the body here, I believe. But I want them awake and sober-minded. Okay, pure and spotless. To have the fear of the Lord. Which I believe the fear, we sung about the lion, multiple different songs. Beautiful. The, I mean... It can really pump you up, right? But the lion is terrifying, right? God is terrifying. And we've lost the fear of the Lord. We've lost the terror of the Lord, like that has said this week in Josiah. We, we don't fear him as we ought. And when he's coming for a pure bride, and if you're unpure, un- you're standing opposite of the Lord, Right? So let that be a warning, but an encouragement to our hearts that the Lord, as purity, aims to come in and purify, right? So to have the fear of the Lord, and um, four, to have the strength to stand in this time so that we can be builded together. And that's really my heart this morning to kick off before Josiah comes up for you guys is to just encourage the process that you guys are already on, that y'all are all, the Lord has already started, 
but also to encourage y'all's heart not to give up, to stand, to continue to go forward, to continue to say yes, to continue to allow the purifying process, the purging of the Lord to come through his body, the refining fire to burn up so that we can be built it, right, in this time. And it's beautiful. I'm, I'm so thankful to the Lord that he is revealing those things. You know, it's more than just sin, right? It should be, anyway. That should have been taken care of a long time ago. It's the things that the Lord deems unclean in us that he wants out, right? So, anyway, I just wanted to share that, um, share my heart, say thank you. We love you guys. And uh, just, just be encouraged in this time, um, but be awake. Be awake. Be sober-minded. Um, don't, lose, don't lose heart as the trials come and the tribulations come and more struggling, you know, comes. Don't lose heart. You know, be, be of, in good courage Stand with the Lord in this time. Stand with the appointed leaders that the Lord has placed in your life. Stand with them. Don't, don't give up. Right? Amen. Just have if you want to come up. Amen. No. <laughs> I was just, just joking. That was really good, Isaac. Thank you. Um, yeah, I didn't know about that dream. You didn't share that with me last night. Um, so I, I, uh, I think you're going to get the trifecta. I just asked Dad uh, if he had anything to share, and he said, well, I'll just tell you, and you can say it. And I said, no, it don't work that way. So he may get up here in a minute. We may be able to coax him into sharing a little bit. Um, so what I have to share, um, originally, I wasn't going to share this morning. It was just going to be kind of a, uh, let me mess with my thing here. Hold on. It was just going to be kind of a word, um, and then Dad started telling people, started lying and say that I was, <laughs> and, I, and I hated to make my dad out to be a liar right in front of the whole body, so uh, I kind of went along with it. But no, I had a, uh, something that the Lord's placed on my heart really since the conference, um, and it deals with the book of Ezra. Of course, I didn't know Dad was going to be talking out of the book of Nehemiah till on our way, but uh, there's, a, there's a passage here in Ezra um, that talks about some of what y'all just went through and really what uh, it's again here's the thing about being a forerunner is you're going to go through things so that you learn the process um, so that you can be a part of displaying the work to others who come along behind you I call it being at the tip of the spear um, and in a lot of ways you're going to you're going to get it more in, intensely. It's called really being called the remnant. Um, I've talked about this Friday night, but the remnant is purged with fire. Uh, more so than anyone or anything else. We're talking about refinement here, not wrath. We're talking about refinement, the, right, the re redemptive judgments of God, not just that come through nature, um, but the recon I'll say them, the judgments of reconciliation. Does that make sense? The Lord not judging um, to destroy, but the Lord coming to purify. And so, Dad was talking about this this weekend, that the process of Zerubbabel coming and building the foundation <clears throat> and restoring the temple with Haggai and Zechariah um, aiding in that work by coming to prophesy and to encourage them to continue that work and that process. And then Ezra comes along and um, comes out from Babylon, being endorsed by the king. And he arrives, and Ezra's a priest. And he's an expert in the law of Moses. He has understanding more so, if I can say it this way, than Zerubbabel, who is a governor, but he's not a priest. And so Zerubbabel builds the foundation and the house of God, the outward structure. But Ezra's job is to reconcile the people to God, their relationship and how they're living. So you see this in uh, Ezra chapter 9. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, in chapter 8, everything's placed back within the temple. The treasures are placed back in the temple. All the things um, are reinstituted. They bring them back from Babylon where they had been taken I and mean, placed in the temple of the Babylonian gods, which was a thing that they would do in those times. When you conquered a nation, you would take their religious artifacts and put them in your own temple, whatever God that may be, and it would, it would be proof, they would think, that their gods were greater than the gods of the other nations. Um, and it's interesting to me that God allowed that to happen because he wasn't so concerned about that perspective. He was concerned about where his people's hearts were. He wasn't concerned that the uh, things of the temple were taken, he was concerned about purging his people, which he would do in Babylon and in the return. So anyways, that's kind of the context. And so Ezra gets there, and he's a priest, and he's looking for other priests. And obviously there's excitement, and they're going to uh, commensurate the restoration of the temple And uh, we kind of pick up in verse 9 here. It says, Now when these things had been completed, the princes approached me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests, the Levites, have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands according to their abominations. Those of the Canaanites, Hittites, the Parasites, no, the Parasites, The Jebusites, sorry, I've been in the church a long time. We like those kind of little Bible jokes, don't we? Or maybe it's just me. Dad likes those. I mean, when you're you're pursuing holiness, you only have so many things you can joke about. So anyway, forget I said that. I just want to say to Randall back there, you know, uh, we'll read about this in a second. What the Lord was doing in you this morning is a sign to this passage. And God's uh, voice, I just say this to you guys, of the revelation of what I'm about to talk about. Spirit of God, the way he moved on Ezra was moving on Randall this morning. It wasn't a haphazard thing. It was beautiful. Very beautiful. So the princes come and they say these things that are in these other nations are within God's people. Verse 2, For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and for their sons. Now this was going on in the priesthood, not just in the people. The priesthood had fallen into the sin of worldly carnality and mixture. So that the holy race had intermingled with the peoples of the land. Indeed, the hands of the princes and the rulers have been foremost in this unfaithfulness. You guys hear that? The leaders were carried away by this sin more than even the people can't tell me what's any different in our time. And when I heard about this matter, here it is, Randall. When I heard about this matter, I tore my garment and my robe, pulled some of my hair from my head and my beard, and sat down appalled at the house of God and what was going on within the people of God. That's where Ezra's at. Where, 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 let me ask us, where are we in this? We're, and again, this is going to be an encouragement to us, right? We're talking about even this season reconciliation. But I'm telling you, part of what the Lord wants to do is to bring back the burden of the Lord to our hearts. Ezra's time, there's, a, there's an excitement, there's an uproar. The temple's being rebuilt. Yes! Awesome! Praise God! But... There's something wrong. There's mixture in our hearts and in the camp. We have intermarried 
we have been joined and knitted together with something that is tainting the testimony of God, something that was forbidden by God because it would taint the testimony. And so the temple can be rebuilt. Hear me, Restoration Life. The message can come forth and the foundation can be laid. But God is not just okay with that, yes and amen. He's going to come down to what we're giving ourselves to and what we're married to. And what we're married to produces offspring or fruit. And God aims to cleanse that so the fruit is completely clean. Does that make sense? Let's go on a little bit here. I'm not going to go into the full prayer of Ezra because we'll be here all day. But it's a beautiful prayer. It says, uh, but I want us to see something that's unique here. And, and it's unique in Ezra's time, and I think it's unique here at Restoration Life. And God, God's making this to be real. Is it's not just, though this is difficult in this time, in reality, how would you like it if someone came up to you and your wife of 20 years tells you that you need to put your wife and your children who you love away from you? But what you find here, generally, overall, and the people of God in this time, because of where they had been and what had been lost and the movement of the Lord in this moment, you see a unique willingness to obey. In fact, we just read it, that it wasn't Ezra, the leader, the priest, who even un had understanding. It was others who came to him and notified him of what was going on. And in verse 4, four you see, And then everyone, including the people, trembled at the words of the God of Israel on account of the unfaithfulness of the, exile, of the exiles gathered to me. And I saw, sat appalled until the evening offering. And so let's skip down into uh, verse, let's see. Verse uh, thir 13. So this, this, there's this prayer. You can read it on your own if you want later on. I just want to give us a little bit of before I jump into 14. It says, and after all, that has come upon us, talking about their exile, talking about the journey out, talking about the fight to see the house of God rebuilt. He said, after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and our great guilt, since thou our God has requited us less than our iniquities deserve. That's an amazing perspective. The people of Israel had been through a lot. Ezra had understanding. We deserved worse, but God had grace on us to bring us out. He had an, let's put it this way, maybe bring it closer to home. He had an understanding of the need for further refinement. His message was not, well, we've, uh, we've been through so much. God, take it easy on us. His understanding was that we deserve worse than what we got. But by God's grace, let's go on, he has given us an, es an escaped remnant. And the challenge here that's coming to Ezra, shall we again break thy commandments and intermarry with the peoples who commit these abominations? Would thou not be angry with us to the point of destruction until there is no remnant nor any who escape. Again, this message that's coming in Ezra's time is to the remnant of God. Can we hear that again? This message that's coming in Ezra's time is to the remnant of God. Not to those who stayed back in Babylon, because there was many who did, who worshipped the God of Jehovah in Babylon... The word of the Lord that came for further remi uh, refinement was to the remnant of God. Verse 15, O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous 
for we have been left an escaped remnant. That's what I see here at Restoration Life. We are an escaped brothers and sisters, and we are further escaping because of what's in us. We are an escaped remnant, right? Are we? <laughs> Let me ask you that. Are we? We are. We should be. We are coming out of religious Christianity. We are coming out of the many veins and the many movements and the many things we've been a part of. God is bringing the remnant out, but we have to see as we are and are becoming that remnant, it is a continuing process of God where he goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And that's what we've signed up for. The remnant has signed up for the fire of God that goes deeper than anything, uh, well, let's put anything, that goes deeper and separates even closer and more exactly than the distinction between bone and marrow. Of soul and spirit. Of who I am in my own personality without the personality of God ruling me. Of who I've been made by the many things through my life, I'm not talking about what God's done, I'm talking about the many things that people have done, the many things I've given myself to. God aims to get down to my personality and correct it and conform it and change it. So we might can say, I can, I've come out of a lot of stuff. But I can look at even my personality and say that the Lord has more there to do within me. That's what we're signing up for as the remnant of God. That even my personality is not okay if it's not completely under the hand and the correction of the Spirit of God. You guys okay with that? Okay. Okay. Michael gave me a thumbs up, so if he gives me a thumb down, I know it's time to stop. So you give me a thumb, thumbs down when it's time. And so I'm going to jump over real quick. I wanted to just do verse uh, chapter, go into chapter 10, which is really the, the, the majority of my message, but the Lord woke me up at 4 o'clock talking about the jealousy of Phineas. So you guys have to hear about that because I don't want to wake up for 4 o'clock and not be obedient. For <laughs> so... Anyways, this goes back to the intermarrying aspect. And let me just say this about the intermarrying mixture. I was asking the Lord over here, because we can be very ambiguous of that, um, because we could talk about many different... We could talk about worldliness. We could talk about the sins of the flesh. That absolutely uh, relates. But let me just frame it within this context for just a second of veils. What happens was when they intermarried, they came into this position that they were uh, under the God of Israel, but they also, by welcoming it in, in marrying their spouse, welcomed their gods as well. And so was, there was the mixture of mul multiple gods. And so it created within them, again, there's just the aspect of worshiping as false god. That's very real. But for us, what does this mean? Let me just make it clear. It creates even... God help me. The religion of Christianity has created veils within us that we have been married to that God would purge out of us so that we could see him, know him, and walk with him clearly, that the veils within us that Christ, hear me, Christ tore the veil at his crucifixion. There was an open way in, and an open, uh, let's say it this way, there was an open way to come in, we talk a lot about that, but there was an also an openness, if we can see this in the spirit, for the testimony of God, who he was in the most holy place where the presence of God was to shine forth. And if we are married to a religion rather than married to Christ, we resurrect veils that hinder and stop the testimony of him coming through his corporate body. 
So let me frame being intermarried here in that context. For us, the remnant who's escaped, but God still is working on. So you see this, that's, that's kind of some of the history. We'll see this when they came out of Israel, uh, excuse me, when they came out of Egypt in captivity, God said to them very clearly, do not marry the other nations. Instead, wipe them out. You will have no other gods before you. I will only be your God. And so we know how that played out, right? In Numbers 25, uh, Israel is encamped near the Moabites and they're in close proximity to one another. And they begin to, verse 1, they begin to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. This is what happened way back in the book of Genesis when uh, those who were in uh, Adam's camp began to marry the daughters of Cain because they thought that they were beautiful and the testimony was being began to be tainted. And then we know what happened, and it devolved into the time where Noah lived. That's why um, they were judged that way. It was because of the evilness and the, wicked, the wickedness that transpired. So there's a history to this. And that's why it comes into the New Testament and says, do not be unequally yoked. It's not just an Old Testament reality. Now, thankfully, throwing a spear through your neighbor, like Phineas did, has been, for the time being, wiped out. I don't know. Brian, do you have any spears around here? <laughs> He's got a shofar. That's right. I don't know. They have this thing called DoorDash. Now you can have food brought in. Maybe we can try to have a spear brought in. We could do like a, a DoorDash, have a spear. No, anyway. Get a spear, put it back up here after this message so the people may fear. No, I'm totally joking. So, verse 2, for they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods. That's what the Mo, uh, Moab did. And the people ate and bowed down to their gods. Verse 3, so Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor. And the Lord was angry against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord, so that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. God is a jealous God. And I want to say this to Restoration Life. We have a propensity because we have some bread that others don't have at times. I'm not, you know, let me back up. This is not to restoration life. This is to my own heart. I'll come back to the other thing in a second. We have a propensity because we are coming out to the Lord to think that the gun comes off of us a little bit, and that's not true. That's what I'm trying to tell us. God, as we are becoming bridal, God gets more and more and more jealous for us and the testimony of himself within us. That's James chapter 4, verse number 5. I quoted it on Friday night. He jealously desires the spirit that he has placed within you. Depending on your Bible translation, that may be capital S, meaning God the Spirit. It may be lowercase s, meaning the spirit he's placed to dwell in. Either way, I look at it as both are true. He, he jealously desires for the natural spirit that he's placed in you that houses him to have the full dominion of the capital S spirit come forth in headship. And the further you go down the road in this with God, the more jealous he gets over that relationship and that testimony. And it should be the same within us of us being equally jealous for that testimony that Jesus would have it. And we'll see that in the book of Ezra here in a minute once I get to it. So, you have this going on here. Moses is about to have all the leaders of Israel executed who have sinned and joined themselves to Baal Peor. 
Verse 5, Moses said to the judges of Israel, Each of you slay his men who have joined themselves to Baal. Then behold, one of the sons of Israel came and brought to his relatives a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the sons of Israel while they were weeping at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Now talking about, talk about being tone deaf. I mean, that is just sheer stupidity. I mean, let's just think about it in context for a second. Here, God's, God's telling them, and this would have been uh, not uncommon knowledge in the moment. Something is going on. God's about to judge. And this is why the flesh is, by the way. It doesn't care. It just wants what it wants. And an Israelite gets the bright idea to openly bring a Midianite gal into his tent to have relations with her. I mean, that's a tone-deaf move, is it not? But when God gets in this mode, when God gets in the mode he's in right now, playing these games will get you killed. Ananias and Sapphira found that out. God was jealous for the testimony of his church there in the New Testament. And they played a game and got found out. They tried to do what they could do under Judaism. God allowed it because the testimony of his son was not in it in the way that it would be in the New Testament church. God was doing something with Israel in this time. He was making that testimony, a testimony that was meant to welcome his son at the proper time. Yes. And so he was jealous in that moment. We are moving and we have moved into the same type of jealous moment of God in his house. We have to understand it. It's part of being his people and his remnant. And it's not enough, again, it's not enough just for a leader or a few leaders to understand it. It's so that the whole body may know and may fear God. Not fear the leader, fear God and come in. Isn't that right? Behold, one of the sons of Israel came and brought to his relatives a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses, in the sight of all the congregation of the sons of Israel, while they were weeping at the door of the tent of Meeting. So here's part of Israel is weeping over the condition. And then this is going on. And he's done it, he did it right in front of the priests. And Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it. So it's not hidden. He arose from the midst of the congregation and he took a spear in his hand and he went after the man of Israel into the tent pierced both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman, through the body. So the plague of the sons of Israel was checked. And those who died by the plague were 24,000. 24,000 people. And we call it the zeal of Venice. It said, Phineas, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest. By the way, this is, let's just tie this in. This is the great, 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 whatever relative to Ezra, who's under the burden of the Lord because the testimony was mixed because of intermarrying and having relations and relationships with those that God had forbid. It is in a bloodline, and it's not a natural bloodline. It has come, has it not, Brian and Ken? It has come now to the priests in our time who are under the weight. Isn't this right, Randall? The weight and the burden of the Lord that these things should not be so. These things cannot be so. These things will not be so. Put away, put away the veils, body of Christ, of Christianity that keeps the testimony of Jesus from coming fully through us as his people. 
Let that which we have been knit to at a heart level that has not bearing fruit be put away, killed and crushed by the cross of Christ inwardly. These things that are bearing no fruit and doing nothing but keeping us anchored to the past rather than anchored in Christ himself. So Phineas is under it. And God rewards him for his zeal. It's not a zeal that is without understanding or knowledge or spiritual reality. It is a zeal like Ezra had. You think Ezra, we, we should not think that Ezra found it fun to tell the children of Israel there, the remnant, that you've got to put away your wife and kids. You've got to send them away. It wasn't an aspect of that being a thing that he wanted to do. He was under the burden of the Lord like Phineas. That this testimony that has fallen down into the dirt must be resurrected to the place that it's meant to be. Amen. That the house of God and the testimony of Jesus... That's why I love this picture... Here in Ezra, because it's not just, again, we're looking at type and shadows. These things were written for our sake so that we could understand who God is and what he does. And if you want to understand and you want to know why we preach so much out of the recovery of these passages, is because in the New Testament it was initiation, except for when you come to uh, Revelation chapter 2 and 3 with the messages to the seven churches. In the beginning, in the New Testament, it was a uh, initiation, not a recovery and restoration of that which had been lost. Now we're 2,000 years from the initiation and the, um, the type and how God moves to recover is in the Old Testament in these passages. What God would do because he does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The book of Malachi says, I do not change. So the processes of God to see how God moves a people who once had him, had his name, had his testimony, and left it, and have left it for hundreds and thousands of years now, from the fullness of what God wanted to begin in the beginning is in these passages. You can see it, though, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 to the seven churches. Christ himself coming, being very specific with them, what he thinks about where they are. Anyway, verse 10, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel. And that he was jealous with my jealousy. See, it wasn't just Phineas's, Phineas's jealousy. It was God's jealousy. It wasn't just Ezra's jealousy. It was God's jealousy. It's not just Brian's jealousy or Ken's jealousy. It's God's jealousy amongst us. Yes. We understand and are coming to understand ourselves, but for the body, for the body, God's great love and heart for you to come into and be what he's called you to be in himself and to lose your life so that you can, in a progressive way, come into the fullness of his life. And that burden must be there, not only for the leader, but for the people. I love this. It says, uh, verse 12, Therefore my... I say, behold, I give him my covenant of peace shall be for him and his descendants after him, a covenant of a perpetual priesthood. Ezra was in that line because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the sons of Israel. And then I don't know what your Bible's uh, heading is for chapter 26, but it's an interesting note here because you see it in Ezra that there's a, after this uh, situation, God moves on Moses to take a census of a new generation. When the filth of the daughters of Zion is purged by a spirit of judgment and burning upon the remnant, 
Isaiah chapter 4. Dad was talking about it last night. Then, and only then, let's read it. I don't want to misquote it. Then, verse 5 of chapter 4, Then the Lord will create over the whole area of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day, even smoke and the brightness of a flaming fire by night. And for all the glory, over all the glory will be a canopy of protection. That word glory there, if you want to do a study of the Hebrew, means uh, it's the same word speaking of honor and glory that is used multiple times in the book of Samuel dealing with the Ark of the Covenant. When the ark of God, the ark of testimony is reinstituted among God's people because they have been purged, refined, and it's fully come forth within them, the ark of the cut of it, God will protect that testimony among his remnant. That is Revelation chapter 12. When did you see that, Josiah, this morning? God will protect the woman because the testimony has been secured. There shall be a shelter to give shade from the heat by day and a refuge and protection from the storm and the rain. What's God doing? He's bringing forth the ark of the testimony within us as people. And there's not meant to be a veil in a dividing line this time within us. That the testimony that was in the ark that could only be seen and visited by the high priest, that is no longer there. We've come to the fullness and we've come to the reality of it. And the testimony that's meant to come forth is the very testimony of God's true ark where his life and his law and his bread is contained within his son, within his body. So, back to the book of Ezra. Phineas, under the jealousy of the Lord. Ezra, under the jealousy of God. Give me 15 minutes here, and we'll have Dad share a little bit of what he wants to share. Fifteen minutes. Okay. Verse, uh, chapter 10, verse number 1. Now, uh, while I was, was praying and making confession, weeping and prostrating himself. That's what you were doing this morning, wasn't it, Randall? I'm just telling you, the Lord was on you in that same way, brother. It's a confirmation to this message this morning. Not because of me, but just because the Lord wants us to understand what's going on. Weeping and prostrating himself before the house of God, a very large assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him from Israel. For the people wept bitterly. Look at the beauty of this and the rarity of this in Israel's history. That the people were moved upon by the Holy Spirit to come and join themselves to come out. Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said to Ezra, We have been unfaithful to our God and have married former, uh, foreign women from the peoples of the land. Yet now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. Amen. Let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives, their children, according to the counsel of my Lord and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. And I love this. And let this be an encouragement. I want us to see the, du the dual fold nature of this, which is really what was on my heart during the conference in July. The people come to Ezra, the leader, God's priest, and they're encouraging him. They're not discouraging him. They're not saying, oh, let's just take it easy. It's not so bad. It's not so difficult. We really haven't done that much wrong. They're saying, no. Verse 4. Arise. They're saying this to Ezra. Arise, for this matter is your responsibility. But we will be with you in it. Be courageous and act. Now, I've been a leader long enough to know that that's a rare thing. I haven't been here that long, but I've been here long enough. 
Especially when you're coming with that type of message. Hey, put away your wife and your children. Those things out of the... Should be, right? Usually most important to you. That has to go because we live in a time where the remnant that has escaped is a remnant that must be builded and restored. There is a... Let's go back to Numbers 26. There is a new generation that God is counting and you cannot be married to a Midianite woman. And there can't be a taintedness to the testimony. And what you're joined to can only be Christ himself. And Ezra had that burden. And the people, God help us to understand this, Restoration Life, and, and the gathering, and every other church. And you see this in Nehemiah chapter 6. I'm not going to preach out of it because we'll be here again too long. In Nehemiah chapter 6, very quickly, Tabalat, uh, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem come with this accusation against Nehemiah that the people are rebelling against the kings of Persia and that Nehemiah wants to make himself king over them. And they're accusing him of trying to gather people to himself for himself. And I'm telling you, you go down this path long enough and there will be that ridicule and that accusation to try to destroy the work of God. And Nehemiah had the wisdom of God. He responded rightly, that is not the case. I am not after something for myself. This message, what we're doing here in rebuilding this wall that Dad talked about. And Phineas, I'll tell you if anything, Phineas reinstituted the wall there in Israel, did he not? And Nehemiah says it. That's not true. That's a lie. I am not after something in this for myself. I would not be here if it was not for the burden of the Lord that made me go before the king with a sad face and could have cost me my life. I am here to see that God gets his people in the relationship that he wants. And it's not about me trying to be a king over God's congregation. It's trying to get God's people to the king that is God of his congregation. And you have that here in leadership, and, I, and I'm thankful for that. And I believe that y'all are not those of Tabalat, uh, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. Y'all are those here in the book of Ezra yeah. who have and are coming to the understanding of what God is saying and doing. And we are saying, and I want to be, we are encouraging the builders to say, Take the place that God has called you to stand in and proclaim the word of the Lord and we will obey it because it is your responsibility, not ours, to make this pronouncement from God. It is our responsibility. Let's go over to verse 11. Skip over. Now, therefore, make confession to the Lord God of your fathers and do his will and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the foreign wives. Verse 12. And then all the assembly answered and said with a loud voice, that is right. You're right. We must be further pruned. We've had the temple built. We've had the foundation laid. We've put all the stuff that should have been there that was taken away to Babylon back. But we ourselves must be further refined. You are right, Ezra. Proclaim that. Preach that. Live that. You are right. As you have said, Ezra, so it is upon us to do it and to Act and to come in divine order with the Lord. So, that's a long way around to say restoration life. Not just restoration life. God's people 
who are in this moment, encourage, encourage, encourage the builders. And I encourage you, the ones who God is building, respond, respond with the, reco- with the right heart in this recovery work of the Spirit of God. Do not, hear me, do not think less just because you don't have the mic on Sundays. Don't think less of the position God has you in. God has expendable vessels called friends of the bridegroom that he's using to get to you, to see you builded and made ready as his bride for his own glory and his own namesake. Love it in Isaiah chapter 48, verse number 10. He's talking, God's talking about the, the fire and the refinement. Verse number 9, he says, I have to do this for my own namesake. What else can I do but refine you? Because you have and are meant to carry my testimony. So for my own name and my own glory and my own testimony, I will move amongst you in this way to refine. So remnant of God, that's what he's doing. Take your place, brothers and sisters. In this work of the Holy Spirit, this final movement of the recovery and restoration. And it's coming into really something we've never seen before. Only in type and shadow. You know, there's an interesting point, and I'll close with this. At this commencement ceremony, this is true historically with Ezra. You can find this in the scriptures. At the commencement ceremony, those who had seen the first temple, Solomon's temple, who had been there before its destruction and and being exiled into Babylon and then returning, um, many of the older people who had seen the thing of the past wept because it was much more modest than the temple that Solomon built. They had known the temple where the structure was unparalleled. Nothing like it really had ever been created. That was around 597 B.C., when it was destroyed, around 515 B.C., was when the temple, Ezra's temple, was finished. And so for those who had known the past thing, they were unable to appreciate and see what God was doing in the present. God help us not to be there. What God is doing is smaller and more modest than what we've seen in the past. But it's meant to give him more of what, he's, of what he wants than what those things in the past ever produced. So join together. Join together, like Brian said before I ever got up here. Join together and run forward unburdened by the past. But burdened with God's heart to see this thing of God's testimony restored in a people. Amen? And Dad, come ahead up. Part three. I'm going, to, I'm going to be really quick. It's probably the shortest message I've ever preached. 
other than that time when we were in Sacramento and the pastor told me I had 12 minutes. <laughs> it took me that long to say my name. <laughs> All right, Malachi, um, I, I mentioned this. Malachi is the final, obviously, uh, book, but the final move of God with Nehemiah rebuilding the wall so that the testimony of Christ uh, in type and shadow could be complete. So Malachi has a hot, lot of hidden dynamics in it. So Malachi, the name means my messenger. Do you know that? That's what it means. So when it's talking in Malachi 3 about uh, the messenger of the covenant, there's a play of words going on with God. But anyway, uh, he's prophesying during the time of Nehemiah. It's very significant that we keep that in mind, what is being said. God is now repeating the book of Malachi to us in our time. He is sending his messengers. So what's the messenger got to say? Well, Joseph, I've been talking about it. I've been talking about it. Isaac has been talking about it. Brian, Ken, Michael, uh, Randall, we've been talking about it. Others are going to continue to talk about it. Just because people don't like it won't keep us from talking about it. Right? <laughs> I signed a scroll over 12 years ago with the Lord standing in front of me. Believe me, I'm not quitting. He gave me the scroll. Sign your name, son. He didn't ask. He told me. Sign your name. Yes, sir. <laughs> I, I didn't say it that way, brother, but I didn't want to say anything. I was in total failure anyway. So some of us won't be defeated by resistance. And the Lord told me in a direct encounter, I'm going to make your head as hard as theirs, like I did Ezekiel's. <laughs> anyway, my wife's been telling me that for years. Boy, you're hard at it. <laughs> right? Okay, so verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 2, I have loved you guys, you, says the Lord, but you say how... How have you loved us? Was not Esau, here's the Lord, was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord, yet I have loved Jacob, and I've hated Esau. What's that got to do with anything? Well, let's go on and read a little further, beginning with verse number six. <clears throat> the son honors his father and a servant his master. Then I am a father. Who is my honor? Where is my honor? God's asking them. And if I'm a master, where is my honor? Respect, says the Lord of hosts. That's amazing, isn't it, Michael? O priests who despise my name, but you say, how have we despised thy name? Here's the tie-in with the earlier verse. You're presenting defiled food on my altar. That's exactly what Esau did. And God didn't like it. Right? Right? See the tie-in? What's God got to say about it? I hate that. You present defiled, defiled food to me, I hate it. Tense, huh? You're presenting defiled, defiled food on my altar, but you say, how have we defiled thee? Please hear this. In that you say the table of the Lord is not despised, is to be despised. But when, excuse me, the table of the Lord is to be despised. That's what they're saying, Michael. Y'all think God's okay with that? But when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? Now, you've got to bring this into a people. This is Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's us. We're the blind. And we're taking communion. You hear where God's headed? We're defiling the table of the Lord when we take communion. This whole book's about it. You think God's okay with that? We better think again. Or some of us aren't going to survive this. And I'm not kidding. Nor is God. Hello? Hello? You present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you present the lame and the sick, is that not evil? 
Why not offer it to your governor? I wouldn't advise doing it, <laughs> would y'all? Would he be pleased with you or would he, re would he receive you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? <clears throat> now let's go on. But you, we're sk I'm skipping down a, a little bit, verse 12. But you are pro proclaiming it, or sorry, you are profaning it in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled. And as for its fruit, its food is to be despised. You also say, my, how tiresome it is. They're bored with God and bored with what's holy. And so they're living it out what they are. They're unholy and don't want holiness, don't want a wall. That's what they don't want. They don't want a wall of distinction and separation. That's a condition of the present church. We preach as much as like this. This is how you thin crowds, not bring them in. People wisely run for their lives to save themselves, rather running to God to get delivered. Hello? God will not be mocked. Is that not right, Drew? He will not be mocked, and he says so and warns us, and I'm just saying it as well. Right? So Malachi, the messenger, has a warning. We have a warning. Any messenger worth his salt in this day has a warning to the present condition of what's called the church. Not a, everything's going to be fine. That's not the right word. You have sinned and you have not repented. The fruit of your repentance is not present. You sin, get forgiven, but go back out and sin again. And you keep this pattern. True repentance is the breaking of such patterns. You all know that? God's able to deliver us, but we have to want to be delivered. Right? Anyway, that, I'm just bringing it down to where we live. He says, and you, being, uh, and you bring what has, was taken by robbery and what is lame or sick, and so you bring the offering. Should I receive that from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the swindler who has made, who has a, or who has a male in his flock and vows it, but sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is feared among the nations. And now this commandment is for you, leaders, priests. If you do not listen, and if you do not take it to heart to give honor to the name, says the Lord of hosts, to my name, then I will send the curse upon you and I will curse your blessing and indeed I have cursed them already because you are not taking it to heart. Behold, I'm going to rebuke your offspring because leaders like that raise up copies of themselves, a defiled, stiff-necked, stubborn people before God who never tremble at his word, and he respects those who tremble at his word, as just I read. And Isaiah 66 says the same thing. To this one shall I look, to him who trembles at my word. Where's it gone, my friends? Are we trembling at the word of the Lord? Or are we so hard-hearted and stubborn and stiff-necked that we can listen without repenting? I'm convinced we all should be at the altar weeping our eyes out like God was doing to, to Randall this morning. How about you? That shouldn't be an occasional. I appreciate you, Randall, letting the Lord do what he did, whatever all that is. There's a sign to the times. Thank you. You were not ashamed, and he's not ashamed to call, of you to call you his brethren. I want you to know that. He wants you to know it. Right? then you will know that I have sent this commandment to you, verse 4, that my covenant may continue with Levi. Now, <clears throat> let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I already said what I said about it, but we're going to read it. 
We have to see the tie-in of what's going on in the house of God and what brings forth, what it brings forth in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse 23, Paul's describing the table of the Lord. And he's telling them how he received what he received. But that's not all he's telling. He is talking to a carnal group of people called the Corinthians who are in major sin, including incest, and they're doing nothing about it. And yet they're partaking of communion. They're in sin, and they're partaking of communion, and God has something to say about it. Now, I don't know how often you all do communion, but I'm about to give you the word of the Lord. You need to do it for the next several weeks as a seal of what God's saying through his word till we learn to tremble again. I've never been that pointed, have I? But the Lord told me to tell you that. that. Verse 27, therefore, listen to this, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Isn't that right, Todd? Isn't that right, Michelle? But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink the cup. See, they dishonored the cup of the Lord. But he who eats and drinks it and drinks judgment to himself when he does, if he does not judge the body rightly, for this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and others are dead. You believe that uh, Paul was moving not only as the apostle of Christ that he was, but in the same arena of these other messengers like Malachi? He's saying it. He's quoting here to us in this passage, really, the book of Malachi. The same sin that Malachi, the messenger, had to address, Paul has to address to the church at Corinth. We have seen four people die at the gathering. Did you know that? So this ain't no joke, is it? And more are coming. Because we, the people of God, don't believe that God does such things. I bring a warning to us. If you want to live, get right with God. And if you don't want God, don't come to the house of God and pretend. God sees through the folly of it all. That's it. <laughs> I thought I'd just one more time dangle you over the flames and give you no, no, no. The response from me, it just, just isn't us. Guys, not just you, not just us. This is the word of the Lord to our times. It is what he says to Ezekiel. It is what, I, what is said there in Isaiah 52. God has appointed watchmen. You have to have a wall. And the watchman will make sure the wall gets built because they got to watch from it. <laughs> kind of way it works. <laughs> no wall. But then the watchman's like, where's the wall? That's the problem. <laughs> there is none. <laughs> Hard to climb the wall when you don't have one, right? So the watchman, Ezekiel was one of them. Malachi is one of them. You have the watchman in this body right here. And they're giving the word of the Lord and it's coming like fire and like what happened uh, many, many years ago if you read church history we've grown used to ease the scriptures talks about it Zion is at ease and the Lord brings the watchmen the prophets forth the messengers forth and there's nothing at ease about them They are gripped by the fire of God. God wants a people that 
are his and they're holy. Amen. Let's stand. See, that's what happens when you give me the mic one more time. <laughs> how many, all of us, I think, how many right where you're at or you can come down want to repent before the Lord? I'm going to ask you to come down. Just come down. I want to repent. I'm, I'm already down here. Um, I'm not standing above you. I just happen to be on the platform. I guarantee you if God starts sending fire to kill, he'll hit me first. Y'all see me explode. Y'all might want to really start repenting better. We used to have the altars in the house of God till they were taken out. Now we, we'll use the steps. Now, y'all never had one, so don't worry about it. <laughs> what a blow. Blow to the group. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. So here's, here's the deal, right, guys? God sees all our hidden sin. He sees our motivations or lack thereof. He understands uh, where things are. We don't want him to get angry with us. Or we don't want him to stay angry with us. Let's head off at the past by true repentance. And not just for ourselves, but may we represent, right, Randall? May we represent the body right now of Christ across this nation. We repent, Lord. We repent for not honoring the cup of the Lord. Not honoring, Lord. We have offered the defiledness of ourselves. We have offered the brokenness of ourselves. We have offered the lameness of ourselves and expected you to simply be okay and receive it. When in reality, Lord, you're calling for the offering of Christ back to God. Christ was given and Christ is expected back to God. Let him who is our life come forth in an expression now. And as we partake and remember the Lord's broken body and the blood of the Lord, may it not come from defiledness of our hearts and of our lips or of our minds. May you break every addiction in the room right now, whatever it may be. And may you free your people. How many say, I want to be free? free? He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Free us from these shackles and these chains. Free us, Lord. Those who are in Christ, the power of sin has nothing over them because of Christ. You are our great freedom and our great deliverer, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes. Break its power, Lord, of the lie as it operates against us. I'll never be free. That's a lie. The Lord is your freedom, and Lord, increase in us in faith and confidence. Increase, Lord, in our homes and our marriages. Increase in us as a people. Let, your Lord, your blood wash us and cleanse us and purify us so that we not dishonor your work, that we not dishonor your salvation, we not dishonor your baptism of fire, we not dishonor, Lord, your work in this day. Baptize us in the spirit and the spirit of fire now, freeing us, Lord, from ourselves. <clears throat> from the grip of lusts, whatever they may be. Free us, Lord. We return to you, Lord, again today, unashamedly. We return to the Lord. We declare, Lord, we're coming out fully to be your people, a holy people, a distinct people. Lord, you've accomplished your testimony to a full measuredness. Lord, the foundation is laid, the house is built, and the wall is around the city of God once again. We thank you, Lord Jesus. You are able to do abundantly more than we can even imagine in this. Yes, Lord. Yes, 
Chris Lord. Yes, Lord, we let us tremble. Let us tremble at your word, tremble in your presence. Let us be a people not hardened, but broken instead. People who remember how to bow, how to repent, Lord, how to come clean, a pure, spotless bride. Lord, thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Just playing off what Patricia said. Revelation 12, 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Yes. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, didn't they? Yes. They overcame this devil, this dragon. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. And because of the word of the testimony of Jesus that's in them. This word. Right? That's what the Old Testament is screaming at us by the messenger. They tremble at the word. They are the testimony. And they did not love their life even to death. Make us a part of the fulfillment of this verse in our time. Since we are in the time. Can we see that in the Lord? What's the Lord saying? Well, yeah, they're going to be that way. That Back someday. No, no, no. He's speaking to us. You be that in this day. We choose to be that before you and unto you in this day, Lord. As for us in this house, we will serve the Lord. 
Let's just say it to him. As for us in this house, we will serve the Lord. We will be the Lord's people. We too, along with others throughout the earth, shall overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of the testimony of Jesus, and by not loving our lives unto death. We let go of our lives and receive yours, Lord. I think it's appropriate. Yeah. I surrender all to you. Everything I give to you. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing, I surrender all to you. Everything I give to you, withholding nothing. Withholding nothing, withholding nothing, withholding nothing. I think the uh, the waiter for us as. Uh, here locally at our church, Restoration Life, for us to respond is, you know, we, we're not going to have service next Sunday, um, but we're going to have it the, the next Sunday after that. But just from now until the next time we meet, is to really just take this, and there's a real emphasis on repentance and, you know, examining our hearts and things like that. And, and a lot of times, we can get caught up in the emotion of things like, okay, we're up repenting and this person's crying. Oh, I need to, we work something up emotionally. I want us to, and there's not, I mean, not that there's something wrong with that, but I, I want us to, what I want to encourage us to do is for the next two weeks, just to really spend the next two weeks in repentance, not, not trying to muster it up, but like, Lord, show me the areas in my life that I need to repent of. Lord, where where is it that I'm falling short, Lord, in my thoughts or my mouth or whatever, my actions, my deeds, whatever it is for you. Just, but but to, really, to really spend the next two weeks in prayer every day, if possible, like examining my life, examining my heart, examining where I'm at, knowing the times, knowing what God's saying, 
You know, where is it that I need to change? Where is it that I, God wants to do a work in me? Um, and, and to really take that before the Lord over the next two weeks. I think that's kind of what, what to do. And then when we gather that in two weeks, we'll, we'll take communion having repented. And then we'll take, like Terry said, to take communion for several weeks as the Lord leads us um, to, to really, in the fear of God, you know, self-examination and things like that. So I think that's kind of a good application for, for that. I know I was stirred and things like that from from all the messages and just, just want to, you know, we, we are living in the time of God's judgment. It's coming to the house of God. It's unfolding before us. We've, we talked about that a lot right now when we're certainly not exempt from it at all. I mean, so God, what is it in me that needs to change? What is it in me that I need to repent of? You know, the internal change, repentance means a, a ch- an inward change and it's followed by a turning uh, in outward action. And where is it that I need to change? Um, and just to really be before the Lord and, and having him reveal that to us and reveal it to you, reveal it to me. So I think we'll, we'll go with that in terms of applying the application to these messages and even what Terry's word was to us of uh, making that application. But um, anyway, just, uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming. We want to take up the offering now and want to encourage you if... We're, if we're still online, I guess we are, but to uh, even those online, uh, to give online at give.restorationlife.org, give.restorationlife.org. If you're writing a check, you can make it out to Restoration Life. Um, and just we want to just encourage you to give. And it's so important that we bless um, those who minister to us spiritually. We, we bless them materially. We sow into that. So just want to encourage you to give what the Lord instructs you to give. Um, just a couple announcements here for us. We, don't, we won't have prayer on Wednesday. We will not have service next Sunday. So definitely uh, take that time to re- get refreshed, renewed, but also to spend that time in examination. Lord, show me what you want to change. Show me what you want to do. So on that said, uh, God bless you so much. Thank you for coming. What's that? Yeah, yeah, Randall wants to say something. Um, Just to piggyback on what Brian was saying, the big things as we examine ourselves are obvious. You know, we're literally blatantly sinning against the Lord or doing stuff. When we all pretty know, pretty much already know those things. Um, I think what's important for us to do is to, those things that aren't even technically sins, but... They're the little foxes. There's those things that keep us from being what God wants us to be. Whatever those things are, that's, I think, the key here in examining is Lord expose those little foxes that, according to the world, even according to what, just, you know, church in general, it's not anything that's a sin or, you know, and, and if you can't find anything, ask your spouse. They definitely will, <laughs> definitely will have some for us. No, I'm, 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 I'm you know, that's that, it's that humor. It wears off, right? It's just, it wears off. Yeah, it does. Yeah, so, um, no, I, that's what the Lord was telling when Michael was saying, I mean, when Brian was saying it, it was just the little foxes. It's just that, that just popped in my head. Just watch out for those little foxes because that's, that's going to keep us from becoming what God wants us to, to become. Yeah, so. yeah, that's really good. Good. All right. Well, God bless you. Thanks for coming. Have an awesome next two weeks. We'll see you in two weeks on Sunday. Amen.